situation, the 12 tribes of Israel are locked in a deadly feud. Mission, unify the nation, conquer Jerusalem, and secure the borders in 1000 BC. Execution, use infantry and guerrilla warriors. Command and control, King David. Welcome to Conquerors. I'm Captain Dale Dye. Most of what we think we know about King David's military career comes from the Bible. It's a story where the truth lies somewhere between faith and fact. Indeed, most historians and archaeologists are reluctant to speculate about what the real story is. And yet there is a window that allows us a look into the world of the 10th century BC, the time we believe King David lived and reigned. The Bible tells us that this was his weapon of choice. History tells us it was the weapon of choice of many ancient warriors. The sling was lightweight, ammunition was clearly easy to find, and it allowed a warrior to attack his enemy while keeping his own distance. Used properly, the sling could be deadly. And it may well have been the weapon which catapulted King David into the pages of history. We know him best as the ultimate underdog, the legendary Slayer of Goliath, the real conqueror of Jerusalem, and the unifier of Israel. But what do we really know of the man? The wife collector, the charismatic leader. Celebrated for centuries by artists of all forms, David has been decidedly more myth than man. But his footing became more solid in 1993, when archaeologists made a remarkable discovery. They found a stone tablet in Israel bearing the inscription, House of David. It dates back nearly 3,000 years. This suggests to some scholars and uh, archaeologists that David was a real historical figure and that the exploits that are described in the Bible are, at their core, a matter of history and not a matter of myth. Most archaeologists agree today that King David is a historical figure, that he created, he was a charismatic leader, and it created something much bigger, more complex, than was before him. Although the debate as to the extent is still going on, David's history is set in the turbulent Middle East of 3,000 years ago. Egypt and Babylonia were the two dominant civilizations in the region. Between them lay the Mediterranean country called Canaan, populated mostly by Canaanites, Philistines, and Israelites, all competing for the same turf. They were constantly at war. The Israelites, at the time of David's life, consisted of 12 tribes who each occupied different portions of Canaan. Though the tribes often feuded among themselves, they were held together by the religion of Judaism and by common traditions. They developed further solidarity out of a sense of self-preservation when encroaching Philistines sought to push them out. They are electing leaders who will protect them from the incursions of other local neighbors. The Philistines come from the Aegean. They have a warlike culture. They are aggressive. So after settling the coast, they are interested in beginning to move up into the central mountains. The central mountains of Canaan were populated by the tribes of Benjamin and Judah. According to the biblical text, the two tribes had elected a king named Saul. His mandate was to deal with the Philistine threat. And although Saul was successful now and then against the Philistines, he never had full tribal support. He was never able to really field an army under his control. He depended on volunteers. And the only volunteers that would usually join him were from the local tribes that were being attacked by their neighbors. The Bible says that during one particular battle, Saul's forces and the forces of the Philistines had positioned themselves on opposing hills. Some people say that 
This is the hill where the Philistine army was positioned. Down below, the Valley of Elah. The Valley of Elah itself is a very strategic uh, way leading from the coastal plain, from Philistia, into the, the heartland of uh, Judah. It's entirely plausible that the two forces could have met right here in battle. And the Philistines stood on the mountain on the one side, and Israel stood on the mountain on the other side, and there was a valley between them. The physical background, the geographical background of the battle, it's very credible. There's a description of the land which fits in very well with what we know of these places. The method of ancient warfare the Bible describes is also credible. Historically, some generals, when faced with a huge and potentially costly battle, often declined a major engagement in favor of a single featured bout. They'd send out their two best warriors and settle the contest like a heavyweight prize fight. This is the context for the famous battle between David and Goliath. I personally find the story plausible because it reflects Israelites engaging Philistines in warfare according to battle conventions that were familiar to the Philistines. While the epic battle between David and Goliath is plausible from a historical perspective, there's absolutely no evidence to prove it ever actually happened. It's not something that we can find as archaeologists. It's very difficult to, to identify small events, especially something like that. And yet, the story persists, perhaps because it's so compelling. The Philistines' great warrior was Goliath, described as a heavily armored giant, wielding a menacing sword, continually taunting his enemies. It was a kind of psychological warfare that a powerful warrior might try to belittle his enemy and demoralize his enemy. The Israelites were hard-pressed to find a volunteer among the militia troops who would fight Goliath, but they had no choice. According to the biblical narrative, we saw that this battle should have really meant who is going to rule. Because if the Philistines would have won this battle, it meant that the, the kingdom of Israel should be subjugated to Philistia. The Bible says that a young shepherd volunteered for this epic one-on-one -on -one fight with Goliath. His name was David a member of the Judah tribe and the youngest of seven sons raised by a sheep farmer from Hebron. Like many great men in history, David appeared to have come from a commonplace background. But he distinguished himself uh, by stepping out of the ranks of this uh, large but unremarkable family and injecting himself into history. He did it with a weapon that served two purposes. For a shepherd, the sling was useful for keeping wolves at bay. But for a soldier, it was a different story. The sling is a primitive but very effective weapon. It was simply a piece of braided wool like this that shepherds would get from their flocks, or a piece of plated rawhide like this with a pouch sewn in the center. It allowed a skilled slinger to stand outside the range of his enemy's projectile weapons and still get the job done on his enemy. Now, it could be used in two ways, essentially. A slinger could use a large projectile like this one and load it into the pouch, in which case his sling, used in this manner, and launch the weapon up and over into his enemy's ranks or using a smaller projectile like this and an overhead motion with the sling. Suddenly, his sling became a flat trajectory, high velocity weapon like a sniper rifle. Now that kind of thing could do some serious damage. But there was another advantage. The sling is a weapon that David could easily hide until the very last moment giving him the element of surprise against his heavily armed and bigger opponent. When David was finally in striking range, he revealed his sling and fired the lethal stone. Almost like a bullet, it was propelled through the air, and when it hit its mark, the center of Goliath's massive forehead, the mighty giant, went down. 
In an instant, David was on it. He grabbed Goliath's sword and quickly beheaded him. When David held his enemy's head up for all to see, the psychological effect on the Philistines was devastating. They fled in terror. David, the unlikeliest champion, but the right man at the right place and the right time, became a hero. I think this kind of sets the, the stage for David's entire career. That is, he's not a great warrior in the sense of power or strength, but he's uh, smart. He's very intelligent. The consequence of the, the victory of David and the Israelites was that the Philistines were expelled from the territory of the Israelites in the highlands back to their own territory. After defeating Goliath, the Bible says that David joined King Saul's army. Showing his charisma and natural leadership abilities, David rose to the rank of Captain of a Thousand, which essentially meant he commanded a regiment. The biblical text gives us no information on his training, but we can imagine he quickly learned and mastered the weapons of the day, including the sword and the spear. In a short time, David became the ultimate warrior. Ironically, David's success backfired on him. His growing power caused Saul to consider him a threat. Saul becomes so paranoid with David's success that he actually sends people to kill him. David escapes from the palace. He goes into the hill country south of Hebron, which is like the American Badlands. David was now an outlaw, living a life on the run. And while he survived day to day, he had a long range plan. A series of calculated moves would set the stage for the moment when he would achieve ultimate power. When David fled Saul's palace, he escaped certain death at the hands of assassins sent by a jealous king. Of course, his immediate concern was survival, but David was also a long-range planner. He began to formulate a scheme to grab absolute power among the Israelites. To do that, David needed an army. Once David becomes an outlaw, other people from different parts of Israel, from among the tribes who are dissatisfied with Saul, are attracted to David. And in effect, David becomes a warlord in this mountainous area, slightly beyond the reach of Saul's organized army, but in an area where there are other tribes that are hostile to Israel. David and his soldiers lived in caves and became experts in ancient guerrilla warfare. They were constantly on the move in order to evade capture or defeat. He perfected the art of fighting with a small uh, group of armed men, moving quickly, hitting and running. He went abroad in the countryside and attacked towns and settlements. David's army was small, about 600 men, and his tactics were brutal. In this kind of guerrilla warfare, the rules of engagement were simple. There were no rules. He was fighting for his life defending against raiders and soldiers sent by Saul, so he felt unhindered by morality or scruples. It's a matter of tit for tat. The conventions of warfare are such that if you come and kill without discrimination, then the same thing will be done to you. There was no turning the other cheek. David, a keen military strategist, devised a scheme that, at first, looked like a suicide mission. He enters Philistia, of all places, seeking an audience with his enemy, the king of Goth. The Philistines had five major cities. Along the coast, you had, going from the north to the south, Ashdod, Ashkelon, and Gaza. And then inland, you had Ekron and Gath. These five cities are known archaeologically. Four of them have been excavated rather extensively. These are the ruins at Gath, a Philistine city that was ruled by King Achish. And David arose and passed over, he and the six hundred men that were with him, unto Achish, king of Gath. David apparently believed the old adage, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. And since Achish was the enemy of Saul, David needed him. So he took a chance and came here to strike a deal. Saul's aggression against David is so great 
that David decides to seek protection from Saul's enemies, the Philistines. And he convinces one of the Philistine kings that he will be a loyal vassal. King Achish thought that David would be raiding their mutual enemies, the people ruled by King Saul, but David devised a different plan. What the text says he's really doing is that he's attacking other peoples in the area, those who are loyal to the Philistines, and he plunders everything. And the reason why nobody ever finds this out is that David kills every human, uh, men, women, children. So no one ever lives to, to tell the story. David is capable of acts of extraordinary violence and bloodshed. He's not a kind and gentle figure. When he brings the booty back to Philistine king, the king asks him, where have you been? And David says, oh, I raided this city in Judah, I raided that city in Judah. The king is content because David is not only serving his interests, but he is also enriching the Philistines. By making himself the enemy of his own tribesmen, the king knows or believes that David is going to be his vassal forever. But in reality, David was anything but an enemy of his people. What he does is that he fights all kinds of nomads that are molesting the people of Judah and helping them. And by this, actually, he got the support of the people of Judah. But David couldn't keep the Philistines from attacking Judah. The Philistines are very successful in their aggression against the tribes of Israel. They're so successful that it reaches a point where there is going to be a single battle that's going to determine who controls the central mountains. Once again, it's the Bible that retells the story. After a number of battles, Saul gathered all his forces at Mount Gilboa in the north. The Philistines mustered their forces and allies together to fight Saul. At first, it appeared that David would participate. David comes up with King Achish of Gath because David is a vassal of that king. The Philistine lords look at him and say, why are you bringing him? He's one of them. And so King Achish sends him home. The Philistine army was soon face to face with Saul's forces and they began to outfight them. Saul's army retreated up the gentle slope of Mount Gilboa. Philistine archers followed in hot pursuit in their chariots. One of the Philistines' favorite weapons was the horse-drawn chariot. Now, this kind of primitive tank was relatively useless on uneven terrain or rough ground. But give the Philistines a flat field and they could use the mobility of a chariot like this to attack Saul's army in the flanks or even in the rear. The chariot-mounted Philistine archers followed close on Saul's heels, easily moving along the traversable western slope of the mountain. Then they opened fire on the Israelites, who were trapped on a flat plateau. The maneuver worked. Saul's army was doomed. When Saul realized that all was lost, he chose to fall on his sword. Following Saul's death, it was now possible for David to come back to Hebron and be reunited with his fellow clansmen of the tribe of Judah. Like many great conquerors, David knew he could win favor with both his sword and his purse. So, on the way home, he raided the Amalekites, hated enemies of his tribe. He brought back a wealth of slaves and gold to the welcoming tribe of Judah. So it's no coincidence that then shortly down the road, when uh, David is looking to become king of Judah, David's the top candidate, uh, not only for what he's able to do militarily, but also you know, he, he's kind of been um, buying votes, we might say. With Saul's death, David was made king of Judah. But to become king of all 12 tribes, he'd have to battle Saul's legacy. Saul has a son who escapes death. 
His firstborn son, Jonathan, was killed, but another son establishes the seat of his kingship in Transjordan, at a place called Mahanaim. What followed was something like a modern mob war. After two years in power, Saul's son is murdered, and so is his top general, Abner. And you have a, um, a kind of a pattern that emerges. Um, you have one enemy after another who dies, usually violently, and David benefits, but David is always depicted in the Bible as innocent, as having nothing to do with, uh, with these deaths. What happens now is that there is no king in the north. And the northern tribes come to Hebron and they ask David to become their king. They say to him, we know that when you were in the service of Saul, you went out to battle. It was you who kept us free. It was you who kept us safe. And they elect him king. Now, David was not just king of Judah, but king of all 12 tribes of Israel. And this was a first in Israelite history. David is intelligent. Um, he is a, a great military strategist. He's also ruthless. Um, and, and it's that combination that make him such a great conqueror, so successful. As king and protector of all of the Israelites, David had unified his people, but that brought new problems. He needed a more suitable capital than Hebron, a capital that would be acceptable to all of the tribes and still compatible with his long-range goals. After a lot of thought, he settled on Jerusalem. But before he could make Jerusalem his capital, he had to capture it. After King David had joined the 12 tribes of Israel into what historians now call the United Monarchy, he really had his work cut out for it. You see, King David ruled at a time and a place where the very idea of nationhood was eerie and threatening to the Israelites. They were simply a band of unruly, warring tribes, and to them, the thought of a single monarchy was not only an abstraction, it was objectionable. The Israelites were unable to live in peace with each other, and they had no sense of being part of a nation, or for that matter, being the center of an empire. David's vision was to forge a modern nation out of this chaos of tribal feuding. He knew he needed a special city from which to rule, one that was centrally located and easily defended. He selected the hilltop town of Jebus, later to be known as Jerusalem. He decides to install himself in the hill town of Jerusalem, not a traditional Israelite town, a, a town that belongs to a completely different people. The Jebusites were a sect of the Canaanites, the people who populated Canaan for centuries. David decided to conquer them and take their city as his prize. He specifically chose Jerusalem because it was home to people who had no ties to any of the 12 tribes. This would make it easier for all of the Israelites to accept the new capital. David uses Jerusalem in the way, for instance, uh, the colonies used the District of Columbia as a neutral capital that didn't belong to any of the original 13 colonies. David also believed the city was conquerable. On the basis of archaeological evidence that we have available, Jerusalem was weakly fortified around 1000 BCE. What they had available were fortifications that had been built, in some cases, 600 years earlier. The people of Jerusalem, the Jebusites, were not the enemies of any tribe. They had never attacked Israel. We know nothing about them. So David had no interest in killing these people. He was interested in the real estate and in controlling this area. He sends his general, his cousin, Joab. Joab examines the possibilities. And the king and his men went to Jerusalem against the Jebusites, the inhabitants of the land. The only written record that tells how David conquered the legendary city is in the Bible. But the account creates more confusion than clarity. There are several theories of how David conquered Jerusalem. 
In the Bible, there's a very, very hazy or even nebulous description of something to do with uh, touching the Tsinor, whatever that is. Uh, one suggestion was that it was some poorly understood cultic aspect in which there was some sort of a curse on the city or something of the sort. Another interpretation is that Sinor referred to some kind of pipe. In the 19th century, British archaeologist Charles Warren discovered an underground water system with a shaft carved through solid granite and leading up to the city from the Gihon Spring. Following Warren's discovery, the shaft was believed to be the route that David's general, his nephew Job, would have used to secretly enter the city. According to that, David's soldiers climbed up this water shaft and made a surprise entry into the city and captured the city. This, though, is problematic since nowadays, archaeologically, it seems to be that the Warren shaft was not in use and could not have been in use at that time. But several years ago, another pathway in the underground system was discovered. Archaeologists date it to the time of David, so it could have been the Sinor or pipe referred to in the Bible. The discoveries uh, found out that there was an earlier water system dated to about 1800 BC. This uh, water system was part of a Canaanite city a very impressive and well-fortified city, and it was constructed 800 years before David was supposed to have been active. Most experts agree that this is the most plausible scenario. Theoretically, there is a water system through which Joab or David or anyone could enter the city in the 10th century. All I can say it is possible, or it is not impossible, that Joab went through this system. Historians aren't sure exactly how David conquered Jerusalem, but the results speak for themselves. Ultimately, he became the king of Jerusalem, and that city became the political and spiritual heart of his kingdom. All the ancient remains in Jerusalem are located in this shallow mound or ridge. From the early Bronze Age onward, this is where Jerusalem was. So, archaeologically speaking, there is almost a consensus that this is the city of David, this is Jerusalem of the Bronze and Iron Ages. From the city of David, just a corner of what we know today as modern Jerusalem, King David was poised to devise and implement his grand strategy of uniting the 12 tribes and conquering new territories to secure the borders. David was now a great concern to the Philistines, Israel's longtime enemy. According to the Bible, the two sides clashed twice just outside Jerusalem. David won both battles. By pushing the Philistines back, David accomplished two vital triumphs. He proved to the Philistines he could successfully resist them, and he also proved to the 12 tribes that they could work together as a nation. Now, David began to build and expand his empire. To do so, he used a powerful symbol, the Ark of the Covenant. This was the vessel that carried the Ten Commandments when the Israelites wandered across the desert. So, after the Philistines retreated from the city where it was held, David took it back. He put it to use as a powerful symbol, a living testament to his power. David turned Jerusalem into a holy city, one that his people would surely give their lives to protect. With this accomplished, David looked to expand his empire. He could also read the situation in a international level and see that at the time that he was rising, there was a bit of a vacuum in the, in the ancient Near East. So that enabled him to expand his kingdom. Um, and that fits in with the, the description that we have in the Bible. In order to achieve his objectives, David built a powerful army, consisting of elite forces, militias from the 12 tribes, and mercenaries, largely consisting of his old Philistine comrades. Ironically, he trusted the Philistines the most, because they had no loyalties to any particular tribe. King David's next mission was to conquer the territories outside his immediate sphere of influence. In the process of doing that, 
He carved out an empire for his people. After King David established his seat of power in Jerusalem, he set out on a series of conquests designed to protect Israel from threats outside and inside. The ancient ruins of Megiddo, not far from the northern border of Israel, are a case in point. Most archaeologists uh, agree that it is likely that David was responsible for the destruction of Megiddo and that later, after it was destroyed, it was incorporated and became an important center of the United Monarchy. Directly in the middle of Tel Aviv, at the Eretz Israel Museum complex, you can find further evidence of David's conquests. This is the Tel Kwasil excavation of an ancient Philistine settlement. Archaeologists believe this was not a part of a major city. Nonetheless, it's yet another example of David's campaign to carve out an empire, even if it was a modest one. David's so-called empire is not a vast uh, ancient Near Eastern empire. It's nothing like the empire of the Egyptians or the empire of the Assyrians from ancient Mesopotamia. David's nation in Israel itself is really very small something like 100 miles long north to south, like 30 miles wide uh, east to west. So it's a very small country. And yet, it's an empire that David and the 12 tribes of Israel would pay any price to secure. David, according to the stories in 2 Samuel, does conquer some of the surrounding peoples, the Moabites on the other side of the Dead Sea, the Edomites south of the Moabites, some of the city-states of Syria, ancient Aram, north of Moab. But there's no real indication that David exercises any kind of continuing control over these areas, over these provinces. These may well be simply one-time defeats. There's little architectural evidence of any kind of imperial control over these areas because no towers or buildings remain. Although there's no record of exactly how David won the various battles he fought, David's military forces probably used the known weaponry and tactics of the day. In King David's day, opposing forces faced each other on the battlefield in long lines of battle. As they approached to the clash, various weapons were employed and they were employed in series usually depending on their range the first to be employed would be bows and arrows archers would fire their arrows into the enemy formation as things got closer spears were next long edged weapons like this one or longer that would hopefully extend the individual soldier's reach beyond the reach of his enemy's weapon things get closer, it's time for swords. These were edged weapons usually made of bronze or iron with a thick fuller running the length of the blade to give it strength and slashing power. When things got really tight, daggers were employed. Now, you get this in the enemy's guts or you die. Unfortunately, we do not have a lot of information from the biblical text about David's battles, except from of his uh, accomplishments and, and the territories that he added to his, the Israelite territory. There is one instance that it is mentioned, he split his army into two. He actually did a kind of a maneuver in order to deceive the enemy, to surprise him, to flank him. David's expansionist activities were wide-ranging and frequent. It was during this warring period when the famous Bible story of David and Bathsheba takes place. That's a conquest of the bedroom, not the battlefield. But it is a turning point in David's military and political exploits. David at this point controls an empire. And it is not really fitting for him to actually function as the commander in chief in the field. He has generals to do that. And even though he would like to go and do, he is counseled, stay in Jerusalem. One steamy, sleepless night, David stepped out onto his palace balcony. As he looked to the city below, he spied a beautiful woman taking a bath on her rooftop. We could speculate that she intended that the king see her bathing 
uh, so as to capture his eye, and that's precisely what happened. And we see how David used the power that he had won for himself in, in battle and by political uh, intrigue. He was now the king of all Israel, and if he beheld a woman uh, that he desired, uh, he simply summoned her. Uh, this is, again, what the Bible tells us. And David sent and inquired after the woman. He's told that she is the wife of a man named Uriah, a Hittite, uh, presumably therefore not Israelite, but somebody who is a mercenary in David's army. And of course, according to the story, David, if he had made the right decision, would have or should have stopped there. But David became a victim of his lust, so he pursued Bathsheba. By doing so, David betrayed not only her husband, but his own army. This was a married woman, a woman whose husband was at that very moment fighting in the king's army, fighting for the cause of the king. Uh, and meanwhile, David was back in the palace taking his pleasure with this good soldier's wife. David slept with Bathsheba and made her pregnant. Their relationship became a scandal. But David tried to cover it up, even if it was a bit clumsily, by ordering Uriah to sleep with Bathsheba. David summons Uriah to Jerusalem and says, tell me how the battle goes. And Uriah says, the battle goes well. And now David says, go to your house and sleep with your wife. The next morning, David discovers that Uriah didn't go to his house. And Uriah said, Shall I go into my house to eat and to drink and to lie with my wife? He said, How can I go to my house when the troops of Israel are out in the field, when my, my, these are my colleagues? I can't have these comforts. David tries to get him drunk and sends him home again, but Uriah doesn't go. Finally, David realizes that he has to get rid of Uriah. He sent his faithful soldier to the front ranks of the battle against the Ammonites. He instructed his general, Job, to pull back his men so that Uriah would be left defenseless. And conveniently enough, Uriah was killed. These features of David's personality, his calculation, his cunning, but also his personal passion and sometimes his inability to control his personal passions are very much on display in, in the biblical account of his life story. With Uriah dead, Bathsheba entered the palace and became King David's favorite wife. That was the beginning of a personal and political crisis that eventually led to intrigue and civil war that put all of David's achievements in jeopardy. Now, here's King David's tips for conquerors. Symbols are important. Find one and use it. Cement alliances and employ your allies. Don't abuse your power. It can quickly backfire on you. As a king, a military leader, and a conqueror, King David relied on the loyalty of his troops. But when he sent Bathsheba's husband, a loyal soldier, on a calculated suicide mission, his men lost confidence in him, and that led to bloody insurrections. Now, those insurrections were painful to King David, both politically and personally. Why? Well, because most of the insurrections were led by his sons. You read the story beginning at 2 Samuel 13 about David's dealings with his sons and with his, uh, with his family. And you see David's failings as a father. I think if you read those stories carefully, you see David still as the ruthless conqueror, only now he's not conquering, now he's maintaining his power. And he maintains it against his own sons. David is a very complex figure. He's a father, not a particularly good one. He's a husband, not a particularly loyal one. He's a warrior, a very good one. In his culture, virtuous acts and humility were not behaviors that were particularly esteemed. So he can be ruthless. This is what one expects from a leader. As David's power seemed to be waning, his sons sought to assert themselves, vying for the throne. And though David ultimately emerged victorious, it was not without bloodshed. Three of his sons were killed. 
When it became clear that David was old and getting weaker, the intrigue intensified, and it was Bathsheba, David's favorite wife, who was most effective in her schemes. Bathsheba slips into the king's bedchamber and makes a remarkable, articulate, compelling, also extremely romantic uh, argument to the king as to why her son, Solomon, should be designated as the heir in favor of Adonia, the, the main contender, another wife's son. And there's a very tender scene of David in his final audience with Bathsheba, and we see the stirring of that old passion that in a way had been his downfall. Bathsheba used all of her feminine wiles and powers of persuasion to convince David to name Solomon as his heir. But there was one more twist. Ruthless in life, David did not intend to go quietly in death. He died the way he lived. On his deathbed, David wanted to make sure that Solomon, his son, followed up and settled the scores that he had that he had not yet settled during his lifetime. He instructs Solomon in who the potential enemies are going to be after David's death. And like that famous scene at the end of The Godfather where all of the enemies of The Godfather are taken care of, that's exactly what happens at the beginning of the Book of Kings. One by one, David's enemies, those who might threaten Solomon, those whom David promised, I will not hurt you, are executed by Solomon. The young boy who then goes on to build a temple is a chip off of the old block. Wherever David had put down rebellion or aggression, Solomon built fortresses and cities to maintain the kingdom. But together, their most spectacular achievement was neither militaristic nor civic. It was the construction of the Holy Temple in Jerusalem. Though this temple was later to be destroyed by the Babylonians, and a second temple would be destroyed by the Romans, David had planted a flag that could not be forgotten. David's legacy to the people of Israel today lies in the fact that he staked out this city as his own. It became the city of David, but not in the sense that it was his city. It was a city that belonged to no tribe, and therefore it belonged to all of the ancient Israelites. Even after the second temple was destroyed by the Romans, and the city lacked a temple, it maintains its status as the spiritual center of the Jewish people. It also became a sacred place for Christians, it's the city where Jesus taught and died. And for Muslims, Jerusalem is where Muhammad found a pathway to the heavens. The site of the temple then in human imagination and in new human spiritual yearnings becomes the spiritual center of almost all of Western civilization. Like the city of Jerusalem itself, David was a paradox of violence and spirituality. History remembers him as a man of war, but it was his ideas and not his conquests that outlive him. His concept of a unified Israel has outlasted the millennia and has inspired modern Israel. There's a remarkable moment in recent history where the military leadership of the modern state of Israel uh, on the eve of the Six Day War in 1967 was considering the threat that the neighboring Arab countries, and especially Egypt, posed to the, to the state of Israel. And there is recorded in history uh, a statement made by one of the generals to the Prime Minister of Israel, you have the greatest army in the Middle East since the time of David. Uh, you must use it. And on that argument, Israel decided to strike preemptively and won a mighty victory in the Six Day War. That moment for me uh, captures and defines the role of David in history. Although it's been 3,000 years since his brief reign, King David's deeds continue to echo and reverberate. Military genius, a visionary, a man who grabbed every advantage, no matter how small, and turned it into victory. Maybe the world should remember King David, not so much for his skill with a sling, 
but for his ability to see beyond what was and realize what could be. I'm Captain Dale Dye. Thanks for watching, Conquerors.